how do I know God? And then you begin to say, okay, how do I have wisdom in a situation? And you begin to ask deeper questions. And what I love is the Bible, when you turn to it, answers the questions every single time. Now, it isn't like Google, where it answers the moment you hit enter, let's go. But what happens is sometimes you go on a journey of not just hearing the answer, but watch this, becoming the answer. It's the power of becoming. Some of us go, God, why don't you just give me something to receive? And God's like, I can't just give you something to receive because you won't be able to steward it. Like, that would be a horrible situation. That's like giving you a two-year-old paint and leaving the room. We're coming back to a messed up house. Like, we ain't going to do that. But God says, no, I want you to become something. I love that about our God. And I love that about the Bible. And being my mind, I, I always think about when you come to the Bible and thinking about questions and what it used to be like back in the day. Like, I remember back in the day whenever you had questions about life. Nowadays, if you ever have a question, you just go, huh, what was that, what was that one guy in that one movie about that one thing? And then what do you do? You just pick out your phone, you Google, what was that one guy in that one movie about that one thing, you know? Or you got questions like, oh, the lunar eclipse or some type of eclipse is coming. When, when is the eclipse happening? You know, we just Google on our phone. But do you guys remember back in the day, you would just ask a question, and if no one in the room knew it, no one knew it. That was it. It was like, what was, the one, what was that guy in that one movie? I don't know. Oh, okay, that's the end of that conversation. <laughs> remember that? You'd be baking. You're like, all right, how many tablespoons are in a cup? Is it three, four, or 13? We'll just go, we'll split the difference, seven, you know? And all of a sudden, the brownies come out a little bit salty. <laughs> remember back in the day, you just did it. No, it was just, okay, we'll figure out. And it's funny, when I begin to talk about that, and I begin to think about the post-Easter story, I imagine that's probably how the disciples began to feel after Jesus ascended into heaven. Because what happens is in the book of Acts, we begin to get a perspective about the day of Pentecost, the Great Commission taken forward, like them going into all the world. Like that is when it gets extremely practical, like the world gets flipped upside down. But before that takes place, there's actually something very unique that happens in the book of Acts chapter 1 verse 21. And if you're reading just to get to the day of Pentecost, just to get to the next chapter, you'll miss this point completely. But can I tell you, if we miss this point found at the end of Acts 1, we will never actually get to the beginning of Acts 2. Because the Spirit only came because of the stewardship that took place in Acts 1. See, just to recap on the story, we just celebrated Easter last week. It was absolutely amazing. Little recap. Jesus died on a cross, but come on somebody, three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death, hell, and the grave. Hello, can we get a little bit loud and rowdy about that? <laughs> Woo! That's never going to get old for me. I will waste my voice to share the story of Jesus. If you were here last Sunday, you witnessed that for yourself, and I do apologize for that. I've had some cough drops since then, praise God. But then what happens is Jesus shows back up on the scene. It's so amazing. He reveals himself to his disciples, hundreds of other people. And it says that he was with them for 40 days. Everybody say 40. What's fascinating about 40 is it shows up many times in the Bible. 40 was a number that had so much value and power. When you read 40 in scripture, it means that there is a time of purity that is taking place. So Jesus stayed with them 40 days to teach them how to live life now pure in the resurrection. I love that. When you discover who Jesus is, you don't have to live in your idea of purity. You get to live in the Holy Spirit purity. And purity isn't just the sense of don't do bad things so you get gross. Purity is the sense of an elevated life where I don't carry the weight of what is weighing me down. But I get to walk in what is pure, what is breathable, what is simply... Ah, everybody do that real quick. Take a big breath in, breathe in, and breathe out. Ah, doesn't that feel good? Can I tell you, that's exactly what Jesus wants you to know. And he wanted the disciples to experience that. But also, 40 is fascinating because it represents water. If you go all throughout Scripture, if you are here yesterday, what did we learn? We learned that when blood and water mix, that hope has a name and it's found in Jesus. But then also what 40 means, it means that there's a changing of a generation. So for 40 days, Jesus stayed with his disciples because he said, get ready. We're about to change a generation like never before. What does that mean for your life? 
There are seasons in your life where Jesus just wants to spend significant time with you. Not because he wants you to do something, but because he wants you to become something. But in the becoming, sometimes we get frustrated because there's not enough doing. Ever heard the story about Mary and Martha in the Bible? If you haven't, there was this one lady that when Jesus showed up to their house, she wouldn't do everything. She got all the cooking ready. She made sure everything was set, like everything was perfect to the T. And then one person just wanted to sit at the feet of Jesus and listen. One person just wanted to run around, talk, and do. But one person just wanted to be still and know this is God. And so at the end, the one that's running around shows up and says, Jesus, would you get on to this lazy person just sitting here? They're not helping me with the dishes. Jesus, the dishes, the turkeys in the kitchen, the sweet potatoes. We got to pick up the kids. We got to work on this. We got all this taking place. And he goes, whoa, hey, sister, I appreciate what you're doing. But she actually does what's most important right now, being with me. God wants you to do things for him, but it first starts with being with him. So Jesus wanted to teach his disciples. He spends time as the new person, this new creation, all these things, and he spends time with his people. But then what happens is they go back to the Mount of Olives, which is very interesting. Again, that was a cemetery. They're at this cemetery, and he's talking to his disciples. He's like, okay, get ready, because in a few days, I'm going to pour out the Holy Spirit. The one is coming that's going to give you power. It's going to give you authority. Don't leave this place, Jerusalem, until that happens. And with all that being said, I'm out. And he ascends into the heavens. Now, I don't know about you. If I was there, I've been grabbing that boy's ankle. Like, uh uh-uh, you hit that going. We just lost you a few days ago. I'm like, I am grabbing that sandal, and we're going. But he just takes on off. And it says they're standing there and they're like, what? Oh, okay, our rabbi just took off, our teacher. And the thing is, when a rabbi left, whether they were passing away or going to a different place, whatever they told you at the end was the assignment until they came back and spoke something new. What did he say? Go into all the world, preach the gospel. Every tribe, every tongue, every nation. Believing, teaching, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can I tell you, Jesus spoke that over 2,000 years ago, but that's what we're doing here today and next Sunday as we're baptizing people. Come on, let's begin to make some noise. We are fulfilling the Great Commission. We're doing it. We're doing it. I love it. I love it. It's just so awesome. We just got to celebrate it. But then the angel comes and says, hey, just as you saw him come, he's going to appear. But listen, until that time happens, do what he said. So they say, okay. We got to go back to Jerusalem then. We need to go and wait for what he said is coming. But before they went into the upper room, all my Pentecostals, where the day of Pentecost came and there was a roaring sound and tongues of fire and Peter preaches and thousands of people are saved. I mean, come on, that'll preach good. Something very significant took place. And if you're just reading, you'll miss it. Acts chapter 1, verse 21. This is Peter talking. As all the disciples are together, Judas unfortunately made a bad decision, betrayed Jesus, hung himself, died. Most of us know that story. But Peter gets everyone together. He's got all the disciples, and he says, Okay, before we go to the room, upper room, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us. Notice this. Beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us, one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. Notice, they said we need to pick someone, not that just showed up today, but that has been with us the whole time. Saw the baptism of Jesus Literally all the way to when he ascended into heaven. Now here's what's interesting. We didn't hear about these people at any other time in the gospel. But they were there the whole time doing the work of God. Can I encourage you? Just because you feel backstage in your life does not mean it's not preparation for the stage that's about to come upon your life. Some of us don't get a title or credit so we think I must go to a different place. I must go to a different marriage. I must go to a different kid. I must go to a different career. Could I tell you the greatest thing you could do in your life is not show up one day, but be consistent every day in what God has for you? Consistency brings clarity. Consistency brings anointing. Consistency brings trust. 
And when God can trust you, you will see greater things than you could ask or imagine. Verse 22, beginning, we talked about it. Now, verse 23. So they nominated two men. I love this. Joseph called that guy, (laughs) also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. And we can't see their heart. So show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic work of the ministry, which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then what did they do? They cast lots. Now, this is just my mind, but I imagine this is like holy craps, okay? Like this is the moment. They get the dice, and they're like, all right, guys, you're up. Like, Justice, what do you choose? He's like, snake eyes, snake eyes, all right? They like roll some dice. Now, again, that's not what they did. That's just my funny opinion, all right? But then they cast lots, and lots didn't fail to Matthias. And so he was added to the 11 apostles. Okay. Acts 2, the very next verse, right over the chapter. They do all of that. And when the day of Pentecost came, woo! they were all together in one place. Then suddenly, everybody say suddenly, suddenly. a sound like a blowing of a violent wind. Woo! You're from Miami. You've heard that violent wind before, okay? That wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Woo! That's some good preaching. Day of Pentecost, that's happening in 49 days. Your boy ready to preach. Oh, but can I tell you, There's no suddenly without the other part of the verse in Acts chapter 1. Because here's the thing. You don't get suddenly without stewardship. You don't get suddenly without stewardship. Mm. Oh, man, there's so many ways to go. Like, I love Acts 2. Like, I love to preach. I love me a healing service, anointing service. I've been a part of it. I I mean, I'm so old in the church. Y'all remember back in the day when we had fire tunnels? Anybody ever been part of a fire tunnel? Oh, man, I'm so excited. So where I grew up in Oklahoma, sometimes you would have, like, a little sectional camp revival. That's where you got everybody together in an area. And they would get everybody that wanted to pray. You didn't even have to know how to pray. But they would line you up facing across from each other, and they would make a tunnel. You remember like football teams, like homecoming? You put your hands up, they run through, and you're all like, yeah, win, okay? They would do that, but it was prayer. So you would start at one end, and you would walk through the fire tunnel, and they would pray and anoint you with oil, and then you would cry till you couldn't cry anymore, and then you would go to the next person. And it just went on for hours and hours, like fire tunnel stuff. I mean, that's, that's part of what I grew up in. I love that, Okay. Like, I love seeing God move. I've been in every experience of the Pentecostal faith, of charismatics. I've seen healings. I've seen signs. I've seen wonders. I am down for it. But can I tell you, you don't get that without stewardship. Because what churches love to do, what Christians love to do, we love to talk about the big things of God, his glory. Can I tell you? That there is something coming for you. It has been marked for you. It has been decreed for you. It has been declared for you. There may be a testing now, but there is a triumph coming in the morning. Woo! I love it. I'm down. I believe that. But let me tell you this. You can preach and pray for things that you will never see because you won't steward the very thing that you're asking for. That's not how it works. So what will happen is churches will come. God, sin revival. Pour it out. I exalt you. I'm zealous for you. I I want everything you got. But do it in 90 minutes. Don't ask for my money. Don't ask me to serve. And make sure the majority of people look like me, act like me, talk like me. Love your servant. And then we go, that church, there's just no anointing in that house. Uh, That pastor, that staff. I wish they would get themselves together. Mm, Okay. Okay, because here's the reality. I'm the pastor today. Great. I could go and something happens tomorrow. That's unfortunate. And you know what? We would all cry. We would all be sad. I love that. I hope you come to my funeral. But can I tell you, there would be another pastor preaching up here next Sunday. (laughs) But you know what there won't be next Sunday? There wouldn't be a father to love my kids. There wouldn't be a husband to love my wife. There wouldn't be an assignment that I embody to carry into all my world. You can't accomplish that. So don't expect the church to equally accomplish your mission because you go into places no one else can go. 
You have relationships where no one else has relationship. Like, can you imagine that? If I was to show up to where you work and be like, hello, how are you doing? My name's Chancellor. Let me share the gospel. They would arrest me. I would be in trouble. Security, they're like, we don't know you. And they're like, do you know this guy? You're like, I don't know who that is. Get him out of here. Why? Because I don't have relationship. I haven't been given, what is it? Access to that space. But in the spiritual, I haven't been given assignment into that space. Everyone in here has an assignment from God. The question is, are you partaking in your assignment? If you're frustrated in life, I would encourage you to look at your assignment because it's probably due to your lack of participation in what God has already called you to do. Stewardship brings the suddenly. You can pray, you can chant, you can scream, you can fast, you can do all you want. But if you're not ready to steward what God has for you, you won't get the suddenly. Now, here's what's interesting. The suddenly is exciting. The suddenly is big, it's over the top, it's everything that we want, and I celebrate it. But the level of suddenly does not emotionally match the level of stewardship. I mean, think about it. Peter's like, all right, guys, we're about to go in the upper room, but before we do, we got we to gotta pick someone. Hey, Bartholomew, can you turn around and be part of the meeting? Like, can you be here? Okay, thank you, thank you. Where, where's the food at? There's no food, guys. I told you, eat before you come, okay? Jesus is gone. I ain't dividing no bread, all right? This ain't happening. I got two crackers. They're both mine, all right? Like, we're good, okay? I was like, all right, so, so everybody's here. Okay, so those of you that have been here since John the Baptist, raise your hand, okay? You guys, okay, come over here. Now, those of you that were at the resurrection, okay, come up to the front. Okay, those of you that weren't, I'm sorry, you missed out. No, I'm kidding. He's like, all right, coming out here. All right, so we've got like you 30. Okay, you 30, you guys remember this? Okay, quick question. What was, uh, what was that one guy wearing? Remember, he had the broken wrist and the ankle thing, and Jesus healed him. It was right, right off of the rose. Remember, it's where they have the good mangoes. You remember that little stock? What color was he wearing? That's right, teal. Okay, great, that's true. Okay, you've all been verified. All right, again, this would have been horrible. He's like, okay, well, these are the final two. Okay, God, you know what's happening. You know their heart. Cast lots. Okay, um, you win. Awesome. Uh, you don't. <laughs> Sorry, stay with us, though. Okay, let's all go to the upper room. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. How boring was that? That was a painful example just to watch. Why? Because stewardship is not always... As classy, as appealing, as, ooh, you know? Let's think about your finances. Someone's like, see, it's way more exciting to tell someone, I bought something new, you know? It's like, what did you do this weekend? I stewarded my finances, and I didn't go to debt anymore. They're like, okay, cool, you know? Why? Because stewardship, it's, it's eh. But can I tell you, in the eh of life, in the middle of life, God builds a, builds a monumental foundation that he can build upon that life. If you live your life going from high to high, whoo, you will fall one day and you will go very low. You're not built to go from ha, 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 dopamine to dopamine, excitement to excitement. Why? Because you're built for times of Sabbath, times of rest, and times of preparation. So Peter understood this. We got to do the Great Commission. We got to get the 12 ready. We got to replant, and then we got to go to the upper room. Here we go. Can I tell you the story that we're reading right here is the exact story in time of where we are as a church. This is where Collab Church is at. Little recap, if you've been with us for the whole journey, awesome. If you haven't, no worries. Welcome today. Let's just recap the journey where we've been with the last 20 minutes that we have. So journey of Collab Church. Journey of Evangel Church International. Journey of the Church of God. For me and Jacqueline, it happened in Missouri. We were part of another church. We said, hey, we feel like God's putting something in our heart. We want to go be a part of Miami. We realized there's millions of people, that there are a 1,000 plus people moving every single day. By the end of 2023, 2024, pardon me, they're saying there's going to be less than 1,000 churches in Miami. There's already a bunch of people that love God. Let's just go and see what we can do. So we pack. We sell everything we have. I left my duplex. It was $650 a month. I was like, I'm going to have to spend a little in Miami. I'm going to look for something around $800. <laughs> I show up to this city. I go, oh, my God. 
They had a little tiny tyke house. They were like, this right here, $2,000. We need first, last, and half of your kidney, and then you can live here. We, we drove everywhere, man. I was looking to living from uh, Liberty City to Hialeah, and then we were down in Homestead. We were looking up way north, and I was like, I don't know. Then last day, last hour, by the grace of God, I can't explain it, except Jesus, we land up on a studio in Miami Beach. And I'm like, okay, awesome. God's going to do something new. And then I couldn't find a job because I have a Bible degree. It doesn't go too far unless you're in your realm. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to Starbucks. So I worked at Starbucks. I was a barista at Starbucks. And every morning I'd get 5 a.m., I'd take my little bike, and I'd go to 16th and Alton. And I'd sling coffee, and then I was traveling and speaking, and then I went back to school, started working on my master's. And then my wife, actually, she has a real degree, business management, logistic management, double degree. Like, she's a woman. Um, so I was like, hey, can you go not just get most of the bread, like all the bread, and bring it home and share? <laughs> so I put my pride down. Let me say this real quick for marriage. Men, it's okay to let your wife help you. She's called a helpmate. Don't be a dumb mate by not letting her be a helpmate, Okay. <laughs> She's going to have some wisdom and insight that only God is going to give her. Listen, God talks to a woman how God talks to a woman. As a man, you're not a woman. So there's ways that God speaks to a woman you will never know because you're a man. So how do I discover that side of God? Discover your spouse. Discover who your spouse is. A little side note. So, okay, she helped me with that. I went in and got my master's, then COVID hit. COVID hit, I transitioned, I go into hospice ministry, driving all around this city, just being with people in their final moments as a chaplain, and I'm just loving on people, okay? During that time, we said, hey, we're going to begin to launch a church. We're going to start gathering together on Zoom. Then we got connected with every pastor you could imagine. Then we got connected with Pastor David Betzer in Evangel Church International. I'm going to speed up for the sake of time. We go on this journey of working, of collaborating together, and then we go, okay, we're going to collaborate. We are going to become a third church. We're not going to be the original. Collab. We're not going to be the original Evangel Church International. It's this third dimension, collab. Well, why are we calling it collab? Because it's the heart of the gospel. When people collaborate together, great things happen. When God collaborates with us, from death to life. When we collaborate with each other, the body of Christ. When cities collaborate together, come on somebody. States begin to have revival. Collaborate. So we called it that. Then property was sold. We go into North Miami Beach High School. We show up in there. We transform the place. We see God do signs and wonders. We see people saved. We see people baptized. We see people healed. We see people get married. We see marriages fixed. We see kids get healed. I mean, literally, story after story. And then, by the grace of God, they get a grant for their city, for their, um, pardon me, the school, which they've had for 10 years but never got. I don't have time to go into that. So they go under construction where finally they're getting a new location. Come on, somebody. So what do we do? During that time, we bought a building. It's called Collab HQ. We use that. Right now, we've been renovating it for our secondary events, team night, prayer meetings, and also as a source of income. We've been written out to people. And then we moved into this location. We launched in here. We, I mean, we've been at church on the move. It's been awesome and crazy and wild. And sometimes, God, what are you doing? But can I tell you, in all of that, what has taken place? The lost have been saved. The church has been built. Woo! And we've discovered new brothers and sisters we've never had. We had a, we had a little article done about us, and I, I love it because the reporter came in and he said, so I came to your church. She said this. She said, I came to your church, and I was very surprised because your church is not what I thought. And I was like, what, really, what do you mean by that? She's like, well, I thought like you were like a hip, trendy church like you. And I was like, like you, what does that mean? She's like, well, you're you. I was like, what, what does that mean? She's like, you're... You're, you're white. You're white. So I was like, oh, I'm white. Oh, my gosh. No one told me. It's crazy. <laughs> She's like, you're white. And you're young. And I walked into your church, and there was all kinds of different people from different cultures and different ages and different things. And she goes, and they all got along. I was like, yeah, I said, just so you know, that's not something we started. That's something Jesus started a long time ago. And we've just been carrying it. It's just a collaboration. She said, wow, it's incredible. And I said, yeah, what we have here is rare. People of different tribes, different tongues, different ages, different preferences, all the things gathered together under the banner of a mission. So what is our mission? What are we stewarding? You know what you can say with me? We exist collab, a collaboration as a community. And we exist to love, lead, and launch people into the destiny God has for them. So what's going to take place over this month? I want to encourage you to be here every Sunday. God's going to do some crazy things, and we have some really big announcements. 
But before we get into that and what's to come in the suddenly moment, we got to understand our vision. So the first thing we do, we exist to love. And let me say this, Habakkuk 2.2, this is why we're talking about it. And then God answered, write this, write what you see, write it on big block letters. My eyes are starting to go a little bit, which is sad because I've had 20-20 vision my whole life. And I, I want to tell you, I am so grateful that you can make bigger font on documents and you can buy bigger Bibles and bigger font Bibles and bigger reading. Okay, why? Because have you ever tried to read something you can't see in the dark? You ever gone to that restaurant? They turn the lights down. You're like, what do you do? Oh, you got your phone out? You're asking everyone what you order one at a time so everyone can see? Why? Because reading when you can't see is horrible. Because you don't know what to do and you don't know where to go. That's why it says make it plain, write it down, make sure everyone knows. This vision and message is a witnessing point to what is coming. Whoa, notice that. When God gives you a vision, it's not just for what is happening today, but what is coming down the road. We love our microwave generation. We get what we want. It's my money and I want it now. It's your way or the highway. But God is saying, I'll give you a vision first so you can grow into the vision and then I'll pour it out so you can steward the vision. And then once you steward the vision, then I'll give you the suddenly where you can have greater things than you could ask or imagine. It's true of the church and it's true of your life as well. And the vision doesn't lie. If it seems slow in coming, hurry up, work hard, get mad, go to a different place, get upset, do that. Wait, because it's on its way. How many of us have missed the miracles we've prayed decades for because we simply wouldn't wait one more day? Because those who wait on the Lord, he will renew their strength. It's on its way. It will come right on time. So why do we exist to love, lead, and launch people? First thing, love. Love, it looks like something. Here at Collab Church, we love people. Like we love people. We love people love people. That's why all of our volunteer shirts say, hello, friend. Because when you walk in, we want you to know we are saying hello with our mouth and our shirts and all that we do. We say hello, we see you. And that looks like something. That means when people walk in our community, whether they've been here before or not, whatever their background is, we need to love them. We need to embrace them. We need to make sure they are known. And listen, that doesn't mean you have to go over the top. Someone walks in for the first time, you're like, oh, I love you. I'm glad you're here. No, it's simply going, Hey, welcome to Collab Church. We're so glad you're here. How long have you been coming? It's my first time. It's your first time? Can you, hey, would you, would you sit next to me? I would love for you to sit next to me. That's what it looks like to love people. After service, hey, me and my family are going to go to lunch. I know you eat food because you're a human. What if we ate together? What if we built a relationship? What if we actually broke bread? Not at communion, but actually as scripture says, over a table together. What if you invite people to hang out? So we exist to love people. Love looks like something. And love is actually zealous, having zealous for the things of God. We love God. That means when it's times for worship, we're not just sitting there watching the words going by ourselves, but we're expressing our love. We're expressing our zeal. For some of us, that's a big thing. You're like, I'm an introvert. I'm glad you're an introvert. Scripture makes it clear. When you get into the temple, raise up your hands, sing a new song. Don't be downcast, my soul. Raise your voice. Declare the wonders of God. Listen, when you declare the wonders of God, you don't think to it in your heart. What are you doing? I'm declaring the wonders of God. No, you get loud and rowdy. If I said declare the wonders of what you want in your bank account, and you'll get more. Ah! I promise you. Why? Because you want it. You ever wanted something in life? You made it known. You weren't like, oh, if they know I want it, they'll bring it to me. I feel I'm in my heart place. I have an intimacy with God. Shh. Can I tell you, intimacy, oh, Lord, help me to say this. Intimacy is birthed and curated in a secret space, but the proper fruits are demonstrated in an outer place. Me and my wife have intimacy, but you see the fruit of it because how we love each other on the outside. We hold hands, we kiss. I hug her way more than I should. She says, get off me, I need to work. I'm like, no, you need a hug. Like, all right, why? Because there's fruit that overflows. Your relationship with God should overflow fruit of zeal, of excitement, of joy, of the things for the Lord. Well, I'm not gonna fake how I don't feel. Well, you need to get beyond your feelings and faith it. Sometimes you need to do what the psalmist said, like I already qu quoted, why are you downcast on my soul? Lift up your head, why is there faith within me? So we need to love. Second thing we need to do and why we exist, we're a community to lead. We love, we lead. 
Listen, this community is going to challenge you. As a pastor, I will challenge you. I don't, I, I, I love you. I'm going to say this. It doesn't matter what season of life you are in. Because of the mantle of this office, not me, this office, there will be an anointing to steward and to preach that all sheep that would resonate with what is taking place on here. So it doesn't matter what season you're in, your context, there will be a word that will go forward that will be inspired by the Holy Spirit to speak to you. And it's not because I came up with it. I was just the mouthpiece that was used for it. But when you come in here and you get challenged, do not get offended. That's the goal of sharpening one another. As iron sharpens iron. We want to cut the fat away from our life. I'm going through some testing right now. I'll get more into it later. Everything is fine, but I'm doing some heart testing right now. And the number one thing, when I went into the doctor, they talked about, they're like, hey, do you have a lot of fat in your life? And I was like, well, I, I am getting a little older. They're like, we just want to make sure your heart's healthy. Like, what's your, what's your diet like? What's your drinking like? What's your eating like? Like, let's talk about it. Do you got fat around your heart? And I was like, no, I, I eat pretty good. I, I try to work out. I have kids and I have a lot of coffee. They're like, well, you might want to cut down on that a bit. I was like, all right, fair enough. But why? Because when you have fat around your heart, it can't function right. So when we come in here and you're feeling convicted, it's not because you have a bad heart. No, there's just some fat that God's wanting to get away of. He's like, hey, listen, I, I actually have something better for you, so come over here. So sometimes you're going to walk in the space and you're going to feel conviction, and it's because of sin. But let me say this. We're also a house that's going to challenge people to grow in God, to leave sin behind. But also we're going to be a house, and we are, and we'll continue to do it, that will challenge people in stupidity, okay? 80% of the time when I have a conversation with someone, they're not dealing with sin. They're just dealing with stupid decisions. Like, stupid decisions. Like, if you're married, don't talk to your girlfriend that you had in high school. Like, just, let's not do that, okay? That's not a good thing. Not a good thing. Like, if you're, if you're bad with money, like, don't, don't go out to eat every night. Like, that's not a good thing. You won't just get water and a peanut butter sandwich. Like, you know, like, this is just some good decisions. The book of Proverbs talks about wisdom. So we're going to be a community that's going to love people. We're going to lead people by challenging people. But here's what I need you to realize. When we talk about this, this isn't just what the leaders, the staff of the church does. This is what all of us do. So what you need to realize is you sitting in this seat, you watching online, you are a leader. Look at somebody next to you say, I'm a leader. Say, I have influence. Say, I make a difference. Here's the reality. Whether you believe it or not, it's true. You're leading everywhere, everyone somewhere. The question is, where are you leading them? Where are you influencing them? Well, I don't want to have that upon my life. Too bad. You signed up for it when you gave your life to Jesus Christ. He gave you the Holy Spirit, the same power, raised Christ from the dead. So you are a leader. So when someone shows up new, when you see someone engaging in sin or engaging in stupidity, you don't go, I hope pastor finds them. No. Come up to him. Hey, brother, sister, I love you. I just wanted to ask. I've just noticed some things lately and just wanted to talk about it. Now, if you've never met that person before, don't start there. Build a relationship. Take them out to eat. You know, hey, what's your name? Oh, that's right. By the way, you live in a sin. Like, don't do that. Build a relationship. And if you don't know what to do, come to the pastors, the leaders of the church. Come to staff and say, hey, I just want to have a conversation with them. Will you do what scripture says and go with me? Hello. Hello, that's how you get rid of gossip. You got a problem with someone, come get a pastor and we'll go with you and do what Paul said. Talk together so there will be unity in the house. So love, lead. And then the last one, launch. We push people on and support them into the destiny God has for them. This isn't just building a big church, building a name where one day I can be a great pastor and everyone buys my book, <laughs> okay? I hope I write a book one day. I hope God gives me influence. I hope all that. But we're not trying to build we're just a hero here. We're trying to build the story of every single person. That way, if you stay at Collab Church for the rest of your life, let's go. Or if God calls you to a different city, or if he calls you to a different church, or he calls you to a different place, or if he calls you to a business or a dream, whatever it is, that we can launch you forward. So what that means is that sometimes our church will be transient. You'll have people that have come for a season, and then they'll be gone, and they'll go to something new. But when they come through, can I tell you, they're going to be loved like crazy. They're going to be led like crazy, and they're going to get the resources to get them into the next season. I want you to think of this house. Remember, we're at war right now. We're children of God. We're strapped. We're fighting this war. I want you to see this house as an ammunition depot, okay? Like people are out there fighting their battle. 
And they're coming through. They're running low on rations. They've got like a couple bullets left. They're like, you got to need like chips, like water, maybe a couple more bullets. No, we're like, listen, here's a buffet. Here's a whole bunch of friends. Here's a care package with an airstrike. Come on, Call of Duty. And here's a brand new gun. We love you. Get back out there. That's what this house is. This is an ammunition depot where we are giving people the resources they need to go forward in the destiny God has for them. We're going to love people with that. We're going to lead them where they need to be, and we're going to launch people. And listen, I'll just talk about this. One of the ways we launch people is through our generosity and our finances. I want you to realize every single week your finances are giving to so many things. You guys remember last year when we did Financial Peace University with Dave Ramsey and we went through that? Can I tell you, we had over half a million dollars of debt that was canceled because people went through the class. Can we celebrate that? It's like that's our brothers and sisters here. They got rid of that debt. And we paid for that. Listen, we partnered with One Hope, with, with the Singles Mom nonprofit that we partnered with. You guys remember when we got all those bags ready and we gave them to them? Can I tell you, we did that. And then we had a mom that said, you know what? I don't want to abort my child. I actually want to bring her into the world, but I'm a little nervous about it. They called us and we were able to sh- uh, throw a baby shower for this mom and celebrate this brand new life. And listen, our generosity paid for that. We also partnered with something called Convoy of Hope. Convoy of Hope is the disaster relief organization that when a hurricane hits, they're the first responders. We also partner with North Miami Beach with Feed America and helping food. And listen, why do we partner with all these people? To collaborate, but also because we can't do everything. Every church is not supposed to do everything. Let me say that. All churches are not supposed to do everything. We're not supposed to have a mobile response unit for hurricanes. You know how hard it is for some of you to get out of your house when it just rains? Imagine me call you up. All right, we're going down to the Keys. Are you ready to go? <laughs> like the hurricane's coming. You're like, I ain't coming. I'm going to love lead launch in my recline chair right here. That's what I'm going to do. So what do we do? We partner with people that do that. That's why we don't do every single ministry you could imagine. Does it mean we're never going to do it? No. We're just not doing it right now. Why? Because we're focusing on stewardship. We're focused on becoming healthy, on becoming strong, on growing in strength, growing in zeal, growing in weight, so that when we do something, it's not, oh, that was good. It was, wow, that's great, and that's going to last. That's going to last. That's why we partner. That's why we collaborate. That's what your giving goes to. But that's also what your serving goes to. Many of you have jumped on the dream team, and every Sunday you're serving. That's amazing. But can I tell you, there's still a lot of people that aren't serving. Now, maybe you're like, listen, I, I, because of my season of life, I can't serve on a Sunday. I don't know what that looks like. Listen. There is a place for you to be a part of this church. And if you don't know what that looks like, come talk to me after service. I will give you my personal phone number. We will figure that out. For example, maybe you're a a man in this house. You're like, listen, all I know how to do is construction. That's great. I need to work on some drywall right now. Collab HQ has some stuff that needs to be built for some things and announcements that are coming. I need some help. Maybe you're a mom or maybe you're a, a single lady and you're like, listen, I don't have time right now except for like talking to people on the phone. That's awesome. We got a prayer team with people calling every single day that need to be prayed for. We would love for you to be on the team. What I'm saying is it doesn't matter your gift, your ability. There is a place for you at Collab Church. But I'm not going to come grab you and say, you, you're going to come right now. No, all I can do is extend and offer a hand. But can I tell you this? If you don't ever participate in the church you will always be frustrated with the church because all you'll ever see is the cracks and you'll never see the character. All you'll ever see is the speck that disgusts you, but you'll never see the plank that's actually in your eye. So how do we get vision in our life? How do we not drift? How do we remove the speck from our life? Well, come next week and I'll tell you how. I'll give you an acronym for speck. It's really good. I got it right here. This is a good one. I'll tell you how to deal with all kinds of, this is a, next week's going to be a good message. I'll just say that. Oh, some of you feel like it's burdensome to follow God. Next week you'll come, you'll realize, no, it's not burdensome. You're just kind of doing it the wrong way. It's actually really easy. Man, I really want to preach this, but we don't got time. So I hope you come back next week because we got baptism Sunday. People are going to be celebrating. They're going from death to life. We're going to continue to talk about the future of our church and where we're going in the limbo season. We're going to talk about how to get the specks of our eye, get the specks out of our church that we need to deal with, but also the specks in our individual life. But then what we're going to do is we're going to realize, wow, now we're beginning to steward in a way where the suddenly is about to happen. Pentecost Sunday isn't just something we'll hear and read about. 
but it's something we'll continue to experience. But can I tell you this? As God does this in the church, he's also going to do it in your life. Because when God builds the church, he builds the people of the church. That's how it works. That's how it functions. And that's what this house will be. A community that exists to love, lead, and launch people into the destiny God has for them.